Okay, we're ready. <laughs> this is the wrong song. <laughs> Not this one. The polka one. The polka one. Oh. Every year, he's got to take it up another level. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're all the wrong song. Oh dear. Please work. Hello. Our next speaker today will be Dr. Timothy Wilson. He will be speaking about data visualization, neuroscience, and why it matters to the analyst. Please quietly cap for our friend and colleague, Dr. Timothy Wilson. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you. As always. Is that it? Do you have anything else? Because I thought you were going to bring it. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about data visualization. So I, this is my fourth year at Super Week, so I'm still able to keep count. So there hasn't been so many that I cannot. Uh, look forward to it every year. It's always a lot of fun. The last three times that I've spoken here, it's been somewhere, something around data science and R and statistics and kind of my, my exploration or my, my journey, as Robert always, always points out to me. So. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that this time. Um, I'm gonna talk about something I've been exploring for a lot longer. I kind of trace it back about 15 years from when I really started digging into data visualization. It was a few years into being an analyst full time. I sort of had some uh, intuition that this kind of mattered, and there's been a ton of research on it. And I think it's every bit as critical today as it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because regardless of whether we're using Excel, Google Sheets, Tableau, uh, R, Python, uh, doing machine learning, we are ultimately presenting some sort of information back to a stakeholder, and a big, big, big driver as to whether or not they actually internalize it and take the information and act on it is really driven to the, the clarity of the information being communicated. I am still a little out of breath from jumping around in circles, so <laughs> clearly, I need to do a little more cardio in my day-to-day -day life, because that really wasn't that much activity. Um, but even though this is a topic we hear about it a lot, data visualization, we hear data storytelling. This is going to be less about what I would consider kind of a pure definition of storytelling. We'll touch on it very, very lightly at the end. And data visualization is a, is a component, a super critical component of storytelling, but we're going to focus just on that. And I still, in 2020, run into analysts who I work with or who are clients who say, why are you trying to make me be a designer? I've got the data, the analysis is sound, I have gotten it into a visualization, what's the problem? Why are you trying to make it look, tell me that I need to make it look pretty? I don't have a design background, I'm not an artist. And that's a huge misconception because it's not about making the data look pretty. Um, it does wind up being more aesthetically pleasing if you effectively visualize it, but it's not about making the data pretty, it's about being understood. Because ultimately we want what we're presenting to be easily understood, internalized, and then ultimately acted upon. So, that means it's much more about science and neuroscience than it is about art and design. So there's a book, I've got a bunch of books I list at the end and I'm, I didn't list, I wound up having to pull one out because it was getting to be a little ridiculous. But there's a book, has anybody read Brain Rules by John Medina? Anyone? He's a neuroscientist uh, and his point is that our brain, there's a ton of stuff we do not understand about how our brain works. But there are things that over the years, through research, through experimentation, we do understand about how our brain works. And those are, so the premise of this book is these are seven rules of things that we do understand about how the brain works, and yet we screw up in society anyway with how we design our education and interact with people. So we should take what we do understand and actually put that to use. 
One of the things that we understand about how the brain works is how memory works. And you'll pick up on this in a whole lot of different sources, but there are basically three types of memory. There is iconic memory. It's also called the visual sensory register. So right now, if your eyes are open, Michael, are you awake? Okay, his eyes are open. Uh, we are taking in through our pupils, hitting our retina, everything that is in our visual field of view. So everything from our peripheral vision all the way in front of us. All of that is flowing in and it is, what's happening is called precognitive processing. It's our visual sensory register. We're not conscious about it. We're not thinking about it. There is no cognition, but we know just from experience that if like a bright light flashed way off just in my peripheral vision, I would turn and look at it because my visual sensory register would pick up, here's something that needs your attention. So here's something that needs your cognition and I would look over at it. So that's iconic memory. What you're actually thinking about is happening in short-term memory. And short-term memory has, is kind of like the RAM, but this is what we're actually focused on and thinking about. This is what we're, we're focused on. Some subset of what happens in short-term memory is the cognition is happening, we're deciding whether we want it to go into long-term memory. And long-term memory includes everything from what you remember an hour from now to what you remember tomorrow, to next week, to a month from now. So if you think about a stakeholder taking action on something that you've presented, it's got to be in long-term memory. Do you need them to remember every detail of the chart that you presented? No, you need them to remember the takeaway from the information you were presenting. So only a subset of what is actually happening in short-term memory actually makes it to long-term memory. So here's kind of the sneaky thing about short-term memory. It has incredibly limited capacity. So uh, this is talked about in UX design a lot, uh, but it's also talked about in data visualization circles. Uh, Miller's Law. So this was back in 1956. George Miller wrote this paper. Um, it was back when, you know, I've never been to an academic conference, but I, my sense is they're, they're a little bit drier. I mean, it'd be interesting if Yehoshua went to an academic conference and emceed it. I can, there would probably be some heart attacks. Um, <laughs> but I feel like back in the day, having now kind of scanned through this paper, he wrote the paper, he knew it was going to be delivered, it was going to be read, so it's got some pretty colorful and delightful language in it. But what he found, or what he posited in the paper, was that our short-term memory is such limited capacity that it can only hold seven plus or minus two kind of chunks of information. Now it's a little squishy as to what is a chunk of information. It's not just a number, it could be an entire chart and it's plus or minus two based on a whole bunch of different factors. That was back in 1956. And you may think, well, that was so long ago, haven't our brains changed? Not really, our brain hasn't really changed. The number of stimuli coming in has certainly changed, and there's a lot of study trying to figure out how the collision of the, the digital onslaught of information conflicting with a brain that's not evolving that fast. But yeah, that was pretty old, and you think, is that maybe something that's been debunked since then? Has there been other research? And yeah, actually just six years after this, uh, uh, Burdock, I think, Bennett Burdock was the guy's name, did a, a study and he said, God, that seems awfully small. I wanna actually do some research and see if, is it really seven plus or minus two? That seems really low. Well, what he concluded from his research that no, it was not seven, it was actually four. It was lower. Then just not too long ago in 2010, a guy named Eugene Turnow went back and looked and reevaluated Burdock's research, and he said, I don't think you, yeah, you did the study, I don't think you interpreted it right. It's not actually four, it's actually one. So who knows what exactly the right number is? It's not 20 things. So when you see, a, if somebody does a presentation and you know, there's a chart on slide four, and then they get to you know, slide 27 and say, as you remember from slide four, no. The only way somebody's gonna remember what was on slide four is if it made it into their long-term memory, at which point they have to retrieve it from long-term memory, which is like pulling it off of the hard drive. It's slow and it's, and it's expensive on a cognitive processing, and then they have to bring it up and try to compare it. Really, really hard for somebody to do. So we have to be uh, conscious that, that there's, there's kind of limited stuff happening in cognition. So ultimately, to me, effective data visualization is really all about reducing the cognitive load or minimizing the cognitive friction that is being required to take in the information that we're trying to communicate. 
So let's try it out. Let's kind of experience cognitive load. And this I've lifted, this example's been used in a number of places, but a little bit of audience participation. Kind of take a look and tell me how many fives are in that, that sea of numbers. Six. Okay. Have you seen this before or you're just really good? Okay, what about, what about if I said, tell me how many fives are in this it's list? It's still six. It's still six. So you were correct, but hopefully, just think about what it took to try to figure that out from the first visualization to this one. A pretty subtle change. Just backed off the non-fives a little bit, beefed up the fives a little bit, and it was way easier to answer that question. So we'll do another one. We'll see. This is putting analytics pirate to the test. How much larger is circle B than circle A? Like X times, five times? 50 times. Anyone? Somebody yell out loud. Four. Three, four. Okay, so this one people tend to guess low. I did hear like a 36, but it's 16 times as big. And it's, it's area. I said how much? Pi squared. R, the area. How many of those circles, if I could kind of squish it, would fit inside? We are terrible at actually comparing areas. This is one of the myriad reasons that pie charts are horrendous. But if instead of looking at it this way, if instead I said, how much longer is a bar chart? And you may not, may not get 16, and technically these are rectangles, but we know that bar charts were just comparing one dimension. Way, way lower cognitive load to compare length than trying to compare area. So you would, people would get a lot, do get a lot closer when given a bar chart rather than a circle comparison. So that's cognitive load. So, yes? So does that, oh. does that mean that bubble charts also are really hard for people? It's interesting, bubble charts, the areas of bubble charts, so sometimes they're still, you can still use them, but people will perceive the bubbles as being closer in size than they are. You still get kind of smaller to bigger, um, but there are times with bubble charts, I think in Excel, you can choose to use the, the diameter instead of the uh, area. So it would be, um, you're really actually comparing one dimension, um, but then you're actually requiring somebody who starts concentrating on it to figure out, wait, is this 10 times bigger or two times bigger? So yeah, bubble charts are, they're good for getting it. Th there are cases where you may want to use them, but don't expect that people really can recognize how much larger they are. So here's a little closer to a real world example. And um, this is kind of a, both Excel and Sheets, Google Sheets have gotten better over the years. And this is kind of an amalgamation. Used to be able to do this just with a default Excel chart. This is kind of a default, but made just a little bit worse. But let's look at all the stuff that our brain has to look at and discard or has to work out a little bit harder in order to interpret what is a really simple chart. And we can all kind of look at it and interpret it. I get it. Well, let's look at all the things that have to happen. Our brain has to realize that, that border is adding no value and can be ignored. It has to go in through our visual sensory register and be discarded. So it's stuff that has to be processed. The same thing for a drop shadow. Generally, we don't want to do drop shadows. Tilted text, uh, studies have been done. It literally takes us longer to read and comprehend text that is tilted and significantly longer. So kind of in the Western world, we generally read uh, left to right, top to bottom. So you're, either your head just tilted slightly or in your brain you had to kind of tilt the text horizontal before you could read it. Which means vertical text is even worse. Occasionally you have to do it to fit in there. Just be kind of aware that that is introducing additional cognitive load. You've got grid lines that you can't quite, can't quite see, but they're there. If they were there and were visible, you'd have to uh, discard the grid lines. We say the word month, we've got the x-axis labeled. And you'll read things that say, always label your axes. Well, not if it's got the months. We know what months are. So now you're giving me information I have to process and say, oh, this is nothing new. I already realized this was a monthly chart. <laughs> Same thing for sessions. We had it in the title. So for a single series of data, we don't need to be redundant. Legends can, are generally kind of, uh, if you can avoid legends, it's generally good. We'll talk about that in, in a minute with one example of why legends are, are, are tough. If we just stripped all that away, this is much, much easier to read. So again, we'll compare that 
to this, much simpler. All of that cognitive friction has gone away because we kind of stripped things away as we went. And there's kind of one main thing we did to this that applies to almost all of those adjustments that we'll talk about as kind of like my number one tip. But before we get to that, we'll also talk a little bit about psychology. Gestalt psychologists, that's kind of a, from the early 1900s, a handful of German psychologists. And what they realized, recognized, was that, that humans perceive kind of uh, patterns. We see patterns in things and we try to group stuff together. And it makes sense because our short-term memory has limited capacity. So if, we try to, if we're trying to process everything, we want to kind of group things together in a pattern and say, ah, this is a mass of things that are trending this way. So it goes hand in hand with kind of the limitations of our short-term memory. And so originally they had uh, five, six, I don't know why I can't, five, five gestalt principles. And they said these are the ways that we've determined that the human brain sort of groups things together. And since they initially came up with it, there have been additional gestalt principles added to it. We're not going to go into super detail on which ones they are. Uh, but we can actually play to gestalt psychology when we're doing visualizations. So we'll do another little set of examples. If you look at this, you either see kind of one block of circles, or maybe you actually have done the math and said there are 36 gray circles here. We see it as kind of one object. With a pretty subtle change, now it looks like two groups, and we see that as two groups. You um, can actually use the principle of similarity is what we're technically doing. Color one, not color the other. We definitely see these as two distinct groups rather than one object. Similarly, if with that same principle of similarity, if we sort of perceive this as being six columns of circles. But I could obviously change that and make it six rows of circles instead. So obviously we're not, that's not our data visualization, but this is the sort of thing that we can start to apply in our visualizations um, and, and, and kind of help guide the brain as to how we want it to be perceived. A principle of closure. So now I've turned it from one big block to this is four blocks because they've got, I've kind of enclosed the, uh, the four different sections. I could again reinforce that with some color and now we see, ah, these are four distinct groups. So they're really relatively subtle changes, but it really does change the way that we perceive what's being presented. So that's kind of the theoretical uh, background underpinnings of what we're going to talk about. What I want to shift to now is some very, very specific tips. And you don't have to go through and read up on all the gestalt principles and apply them. Just know that that's kind of the underpinnings of this, um, a lot of what we'll talk about in the specific tips. If you take a single tip away from this session, it would be this one, to maximize the data pixel ratio. So. Do a quick show of hands. How many people know of Stephen Few? Pretty good. How many people? Edward Tufte? Okay, so Few completely ripped this off from Tufte. He was very open about it. Tufte posited the maximizing the data ink ratio, and Few said, well, we're living in a digital age. Let's make it the data pixel ratio. So what is it? Well, what Few said was that every non-background pixel on a screen is either representing data or information or it's not, it's just structural or decorative. And so this idea is that you, you don't actually calculate this ratio, but you could take the percentage of the non-background pixels that are displaying or representing information and divide it by the total pixels, and you want that ratio to be as high as possible. I will not let go of referring to this as maximizing the data pixel ratio. It is like the most convoluted way to refer to it. Uh, years ago, I did some training with Mo's sister, Michelle, and she kind of said the same thing, like, why do you go bend yourself all around to explain what maximizing the data pixel ratio is? Why don't you just say, pretend your printer's running out of ink? You get to the same result. Imagine that you've got like 10 charts you want to get printed, your inkjet printer is saying, I'm done, I've got nothing left, and you have an opportunity to edit those visualizations before you print them. What are you going to remove to conserve ink? Or another way, kind of pulling from, um, anybody know who this guy is? French. French. Where was he born? France. Where in France? <laughs> Lyon. Oh. There you go. That was a little, little pandering there. <laughs> uh, so he wrote The Little Prince. 
But you know, he wrote that perfection is achieved not when we, there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So whichever one of those is most memorable for you, it is a reductive exercise, removing things, and there's an enormous amount of power in it. So if we go back to this first example of the, the two charts, largely what was done was removing things. And removing things means not only, and it's tough when you're projecting where you're not sure exactly how well stuff's gonna be lit, but removing things means there is a different, a pixel is lighter if it's gray than if it's black. And we can start kind of backing things out. Um, if you'll actually notice the line itself, the actual data, it's actually heavier on the right. So you can beef up the data information, you can push back the stuff that is lesser information, and you'll wind up with something that is cleaner. It will wind up being perceived as more aesthetically pleasing or prettier, uh, not that this is a pretty chart by any means, but, um, and it's really just applying that one principle to it. So it doesn't have to be done just with charts, we can do it with tables of data as well. And this is our tendency, hey, we've got a table of numbers we're going to present, um, let's make it better. You know, maybe we'll invert the heading, we'll make the outside border kind of thick. We're actually adding pixels that are not data information. If we instead went in the opposite direction and reduced the lesser information, we don't need the border, we don't need the vertical lines, um, we don't really even need the horizontal lines, although maybe we do. So that, that kind of varies based on how large the table is. We do need the headings, that is information, but it's kind of meta information, it's not the actual data. So we can sort of back that off. I promise this takes like two or three years to really hit kind of stabilization. If you start trying to consciously apply maximizing the data pixel ratio, go back, I challenge you to take any chart you've got, just try to, as brutally as possible, apply this principle, set it aside, put a reminder on your calendar for six months from now, pull it up again, and you'll realize you could have gone farther. Um, it happened to me for like years. I still go back, and even when I was making this exact point in a presentation five years ago, when I pull something up and say, why did I leave the tick marks on the chart? Those could go away. So once you start getting the practice of this, you see it everywhere, and it's so easy to just kind of pull things out or lighten things up. So pie charts are evil. It's kind of fun to just Google, are pie charts evil? Like there are pages and pages of uh, blog posts on it. They're evil for any number of reasons. Let's think about the cognitive load that goes into interpreting this pie chart. Um, you notice with pie charts, if it's got more than, than, than two or three wedges in it, your eye is bouncing back and forth from the legend back to the wedge. You're like, I want to compare these two wedges, which we're comparing areas, which is tough for us to do, as we demonstrated earlier, but now I have to hold the size of those wedges, bounce to the legend, figure out what they're actually relating to. There is a massive amount of cognitive load going into processing a pie chart. When pie charts generally can be represented as a horizontal bar chart. Now this is a little bit different in that I'm actually showing the raw counts instead of the percentages. And there is something that's missing here is that a horizontal, by, pie, a horizontal bar chart does not say, does not scream, this is all the components of a whole. So that's the one thing that a pie chart has over a horizontal bar chart. We could do the horizontal bar chart with percentages instead. Um, we could remove grid lines. So we've also kind of pushed that data pixel ratio as high as we can by uh, only having what's, what's rendered there um, representing data. And it's a lot easier for us to read because we can just scan from the top to bottom and we can very quickly compare the links uh, to each other. I'm not even gonna talk about 3D pie charts because those you have whole other worlds of, of us misinterpreting the, the areas. But it is fun, lots of people have kind of railed against pie charts for years for good reason. So vendors sort of heard, they're like, yeah, pie charts are terrible. So about seven or eight years ago, they're like, we're not gonna do pie charts, but food's good. So we'll do, we'll do donut charts. I didn't realize until just a few months ago that how you actually create a donut chart in Data Studio. Uh, anybody know you actually make a pie chart and then you actually specify how big you want the circle in the middle? Oh my God, you're trying to compare the lengths of an arc? How can that possibly be good for the brain? That's insane. So uh, to steal from Cole Naflick, uh, food charts are bad. Food is good, food charts are just generally bad. Generally bad. Pie charts 
can be good if you are really focused on the parts of the whole. In digital analytics, new versus returning users, right? We're conditioned that's like the home page. Is it still the main page on Google Analytics? Does it still have that pie chart? Yes. Okay, or in the audience section, I don't know. If you only have two or three and you're not compared to, worried about the precision, you just kind of want to look at kind of the relative proportion, they're okay. Um, this pie chart is actually terrible. Anybody, is there anybody who can volunteer as to why it's terrible? Red, green, colorblind. Yep, that's what it looks like to somebody with red, green, color blindness. Not exactly. Huh? I'm colorblind, I can see the difference. You can? Yes. Are you red, green, colorblind? Yes. And you can? Yes. Does it Deuteronomy that you have? Deuteronomy, yeah. I don't see how you can see the difference then. I'm confused. You can see, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Maybe it's not a problem for color blindness, except I've worked with people who've had managers who said after the fourth time I gave them this report, they finally said, could you please stop using, really, we don't want to use color as the sole communicating factor of anything. Beyond color blindness, there's people still printing, they might print on a black and white printer. And if you had a third color here, it starts to get really tough. So color is super powerful as an accent, um, is reinforcing the information. To, to help the brain figure out what is important, but using color is the kind of requisite way to process the chart, generally pretty bad. So uh, there are tools out there that are free. Uh, I'm a Mac user, so I use Sim Daltonism. I will fire it up if I have any question that something might be unclear. It just gives you a little lens, you pick which type of color blindness, and you mouse over, uh, or you move the whole little lens over it, and it will show you supposedly what it looks like, although apparently not, and I gotta figure that out. There's also Color Oracle, which is supposed to work on Windows and Mac. For some reason, I can't get it to work on my Mac, but it supposedly does kind of the same thing. But I just have that, and I have gotten used to, if somebody sends me something and says, what do you think? And I think, oh, they're relying on color, I'll fire it up and do a quick, a quick check, because it's super easy, super quick, and easy to uh, correct. So you'll see people use kind of blues and oranges instead of red and green giving up a little bit and that we've been conditioned on what red and green mean, but people still kind of figure it out. So horizontal bar charts are uh, awesome. I've sort of felt that way for a long time. On the flight over here, I was reading Cole Naflick's first book, uh, Data Storytelling, and she actually kind of said the same thing. I'm like, huh, maybe I read that from her a few years ago and I've been thinking it was an original thought. But we really read horizontal bar charts well. It just goes with the way in the Western world that we, are, we take information in. So horizontal bar charts are great, but there are a number of things we can do beyond just a single series horizontal bar chart. If we're actually trying to compare two numbers, we, can, uh, we don't have to repeat the, the labels. Imagine if you were comparing two pie charts, which I guess you wouldn't do with bounce rate, or you would, but it would be horrible. Uh, our eyes kind of go to the fact that, oh, what's going on with that that display, something is jumping out. But you also could really reinforce it and say, what I really want to talk about is display, non-trivial traffic, super high bounce rate. So if you actually start your visualizations with a very muted, uh, uh, make everything kind of muted and gray, and then you selectively add in the accent, and you can pick you know, the accent colors, pick it from your company's palette, what's a good accent? Try not to use red or green, because those have kind of associations with them. But pick a color from your company's palette or your client's palette. You can use that as an accent. It's very, very easy for the brain to kind of hone in on exactly what it is we're talking about or focused on. So they actually work in a compact form as well. So in this case, I've added another column of data. And what's interesting, if you look at this, and it's a simple table of data, I realize, but we're sticking with kind of simple examples. There's actually a length component to the sessions when we've got a volume metric. It's kind of a reversed bar chart. You could, it could be very out of focus and you could still tell which numbers are longer and shorter. But when you get to the bounce rate, they're all two digits, they look the same. The cognitive load of having to read through the numbers to say, are any of these numbers really different in a way that I care about? So avoid tables of numbers if at all possible. It's very easy to take the table of numbers and instead of adding all the cognitive load of expecting somebody to read through them, you can add horizontal bars within that. So you can do this with, with Sheets, with Data Studio, with Excel. There are kind of different techniques for it. And note that while I've added pixels, I've only added 
data information pixels, data pixels. I'm adding reinforcing pixels with those visualizations. And I can now get a comparison of three metrics and even sort of highlight the one that I'm really trying to draw the eye to. And with sheets, it's harder to, you can't really, I don't know how to do this in Excel. With sheets, you can even do like condition, conditional formatting to um, you know, maybe dynamically figure out which one gets highlighted. If you're always trying to highlight the highest bounce rate uh, row, you can do that with, with formulas. And obviously, doing that with R and ggplot, um, Tableau, you name it, pretty straightforward. So this table's just a little bit bigger. Didn't really have to be, but it is just a little bit bigger to give it a little bit more uh, space, but way, 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 way easier to read. This is kind of data visualization, kind of things that annoy Tim, which to me just exudes like laziness on the uh, analyst part. Oh, we're just gonna pull out the, uh, the, the medium uh, straight out. And one that I will call as a cognitive load, regardless of who the stakeholder is, if they own the entire paid search budget, and they are really, really focused on it, I will still claim that when you throw CPC in a label, the stakeholder has to say, CPC, I know that's cost per click. Which of our media is cost per click? Okay, that's paid search. Potentially is like, oh, but wait a minute, we had that other cost per click thing too. Is that included? Can cause a real mess. Take the time to put it in plain English. Um, to do this with just a little mapping table, so you're actually conveying it in the stakeholders' terms. Don't make them do that translation. That is cognitive friction that's being uh, added. So a place where it's okay to add a little bit of cognitive friction is, and this being kind of on the consulting side, run into this all the time. Somebody sends a report that another agency produced or that they produced, and they're like, "Hey, you know, what do you think of this data?" And I just have a deck, and nowhere in the deck is it clear when I'm looking at any particular visualization where the data came from, what the time frame was, what segment of the data it was. So you obviously can't post like an entire SQL query here, but put in a little footnote. Put it in gray, put it out of the way. We read top to bottom. So you're trying to minimize the, the priority of it. Um, but when somebody asks, oh, hey, what was the time frame for this? And you can, there we, you missed the dancing earlier. So that's why it was back there. Uh, I, I'm afraid so. Um, there's no soundtrack. That's going to be added later. Uh, it's acapella. So, uh, so, so take the time to put that in. And you may still get asked, somebody may say, oh, what's the time frame? Because they won't even see it. That's kind of good. You can say, oh, it's actually there in the footer, the time frame. And they're like, ah, okay, now I've got it. And they'll kind of learn how to read it. But I'm a, that gets debated occasionally of whether you add that information. I'm a huge proponent of, I've been burned by it so many times. Um, put it on the slide. I actually had a case uh, last year where another analyst had a whole deck. And they put the time frame on like the second slide, kind of the setup for the whole thing. And they're like, all the data in, the desk, in this deck is for this time frame. And then there were like 25 slides. And by the time they got to a chart that the stakeholder really cared about, um, the stakeholder was like, no, what, what time frame was this again? Well, it was back to that, huh? Slide two. Slide two, yeah. Remember your short-term memory, so take the time to put it on every slide. Okay, this is kind of, I think these are generally known, but it's kind of worth saying. This is actually a default in uh, Google Sheets that was kind of annoying uh, that way too many significant digits. We're implying a whole lot of precision that we don't need, especially on the y-axis. We do not need to have dot zero zero. Um, that's why some often, depending if you're doing like millions, it's often better to say, let me just make it, you know, 15 mm or, you know, all numbers in millions. It's a little bit of a judgment call as to when you um, kind of show something in thousands or millions. But, Certainly that, those extra zeros you want to turn off. In a lot of cases, you don't want, we don't want to, and we've, this is, we wring our hands about this all the time, kind of the precision versus accuracy, that if we, yes, we have numbers that go out to seven decimal places, but we know that there's some squishiness in that. So be deliberate uh, with how much uh, we actually show. Um, 
if we're actually labeling it, we can uh, labeling the, the values, we can actually kill the axis entirely because we're showing it. Now this, in theory, uh, somebody now has to just intuit that this is a zero-based axis, but that's what we intuit, so that's fine. Everybody's gonna kind of understand this. With presenting test results particularly, if you have said there are, this is not a statistically significant difference, and it can be confusing to the stakeholder if you say, well, but it was 2.1 and 2.3 or 2.5, I'm seeing a difference. So instead, you can do little subtle things and say, there's variability. Let me put some error bars on that. Maybe I'm not even gonna show you the actual numbers, because what I'm gonna imply is this is what we measured. Statistics says it's, the reality is probably somewhere in here, and now when I tell you that there's not a statistically significant difference, Intuition means a little bit, is, is gonna support that, right? Error bars do require a little bit more cognition to process, but we're really focusing in on what message are we trying to communicate. Um, so there were like four different ways we could present exactly the same data and little subtle tweaks, hopefully, as I'm ranting here, you can see that those little subtle tweaks actually can make it a lot easier to be understood. So enough with the bars. We'll talk about some other types of visualizations. So the key with other, like we, we, there's nothing wrong with bars, line charts, even the occasional pie chart. That's what we're used to. And it will come up occasionally, well, I've already put like, everything I've represented have been five bar charts. I just wanted to kind of mix it up for variety. Terrible reason to change. I just want to do something different. You only want to use another type of visualization from whatever you're using, you wanna be choosing what is the best visualization for the information that you're trying to convey. But yes, there are times where we need other types of visualization. We're adding cognitive load, but that's because the data is a little bit more involved in some cases. So there's, this thing's been around for gotta be close to 20 years at, at, some, at this point, um, and people will float it out in data visualization presentations. It's a flow chart. Um, I'm like, that's a nice idea, but who actually thinks that way about their data following a flow chart? But it's been around forever. They actually now have an extreme slide chooser as well. I've seen it printed on the walls of people's uh, cubicles. What is useful about something like this is just reading and making sure you're familiar with all the different types of charts. Waterfall charts are amazing in the right scenario. So it's good to know what a waterfall chart is and what it's good for. Uh, there is a more recent, but this has still been around for close to a decade, I think. Juice Analytics has an online chart chooser. It's a little easier to, on the eyes, I think. But same sort of thing, it gives you a way to scan and just be aware of the different types of charts that there are. So, but if you're the kind of person who really wants to have a flow chart and a selector to follow, there are resources out there for that. So, not on those chart choosers are sparklines. And sparklines uh, are, amazing in the right scenario. Because a lot of times, if we see a number, the first question is, well, how's it been trending? Or that was the number for the month. Was that because we had one huge spike in the month? Or was that because it was steady over the course of the month? And sparklines contain a whole bunch of data points, but in just one little object. And we will see that it is just a normal pattern, fairly stable, and we'll just kind of quickly be able to process that. But if there is a spike, or if there is a big dip, or if the data is trending, we will um, also quickly pick up on that. And maybe we then ask for more as to what actually caused that. So it's a way to use limited pixels to get actually a lot of information that's a really handy reference uh, bit of information. The downside of sparklines is that they don't do magnitude well. So on the right, we have very different scaled totals, but the spark lines all look about the same magnitude. So they're, you, you kind of give up a little bit, uh, but there are ways you can actually work around that as well. The other thing that this example, and these are both Data Studio, but I've done this in just about every visualization platform I've worked with, is the use of uh, font size. So if you're drawing the eye, you want to reduce the cognition, everybody in here read that 6,285 because the font's bigger, significantly bigger. More data pixels are devoted to that number. So when it's making a number bigger, it's not like, well, I made it bigger, but I was trying to fit a bunch of stuff on, so I made the big number 14 points and I made the other one 12 points. Now you've introduced more cognitive friction because the brain will try to figure out if one is bigger than the other because they're similar and if they are bigger, it'll start heading down a path of, 
Is that significant or is it accidental? So you really need to kind of go, go big, go big or go home. Um, this actually says this is the number we care about. The other information is secondary. I've lightened up on it. Yes, you want to know how did that compare to whatever the other time frame was, but mainly I'm trying to show you the number. Box plots, the more I've kind of gotten into more statistics and the, the world of kind of data science type stuff, the more I'm working with more granular and detailed data. Uh, box plots are definitely have more cognitive load because a lot of stakeholders certainly aren't used to looking at box plots. But if you're trying to illustrate what is the variability of the data um, and give them a pause, that's what you're trying to show them. Where's the data centered and kind of how much spread is it? So this was a comparison of like 41 different attribution models, some heuristic, some algorithmic. Um, and that was kind of the point of what we were talking about was how much does it even matter if you change to some other uh, 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 attribution model? So uh, in the color, I did use color to show heuristic versus algorithmic. That wasn't super, super critical. It was kind of nice to just be able to, to show or actually ask questions about the top one. But, uh, so bar charts. We're back to bar charts. I thought we were done with bar charts. All the bar charts I showed were a single series of data. Certainly with bar charts, you can do stack bar charts. There are a lot of challenges introduced with uh, stack bar charts when it comes to comparing uh, different values. I'm not really going to go down. This is kind of hard as well. There's something that's, there's one of these is not like the other. Has anybody kind of noticed which channel kind of has something that's a little different? Organic, okay, that's good. I'm introducing a little cognitive load though because I could have done it this way. And I would claim that everybody would have much more quickly, or at least you would have had to spend fewer brain cycles to actually recognize that organic is not like that. And I'm not done yet. I can do more than that. If I'm really trying to call out that organic is lower, let me back off the other ones. So a slope graph is really just a line chart with only two points. Uh, this is a way if you can remove the legend, so you're not having to bounce back and forth, just put a label. Now, I don't have the actual numbers next to it. I could. I could put a y-axis on there if it was really necessary. It depends on what I'm trying to convey. If I'm trying to say traffic or revenue or orders from every channel went up year over year, except for organic search, this gets to you a lot faster. It's telling the same story than this. This requires a lot more work to actually see that. Heat maps, love me some heat maps. Again, Google used maybe still does on their homepage. They have kind of this same basic one with, with traffic. But doing heat maps is a way to reinforce. So this is back to using color to reinforce the information that's already uh, communicated. So there's a little bit of a problem with this one. I'm repeating myself now. Are you gonna tell me that, can you tell the difference between the color of the 43 and the color of the 609? Sort of. More of a contrast, but it's kind of it. Okay. So uh, this was what Sim Daltonism says the difference is. So you can see the differences, but now you don't really know why. It almost looks like the top left and the bottom right might actually be similar. So using monochromatic heat maps is a way to get around that. Uh, whether you're picking a color that has some associations like green or whether you just pick like a kind of a muted blue, um, what can be really nice, like in this case, it really tells you like the volume here is in the top left. All the stuff kind of in the bottom right is really just, just noise. Super easy to do with uh, conditional formatting or with, with geom tiles and ggplot. Lots of ways to do it. Scatter plots can be great because um, you can start to look for outliers. You may actually want to highlight the outliers. This had to have a log scale. It's bad. That's kind of introducing cognitive friction. but. Uh, if you've got two metrics and you're looking at the relationship and trying to call out these things are not like the others, scatter plots can be awesome. Uh, geographic overlays, little, little pat myself on the back. You know what I'm proud of is that when I came in this morning to try that, that gray was so washed out, I was like, you couldn't even see it on the screen. So I went back to my room this morning, my R code from like a year and a half ago still ran. So this is data updated as of about 9 a.m. this morning of followers of the Analytics Hour Twitter account. Um, the only time in history that code that I wrote more than two days ago actually runs the second time. Where is, where is Ukraine? Huh? Where is Ukraine? Well, 
oh look, I'm a child of a Texas public school education. I barely know where Europe is. So uh, it's a miracle that I got here. Um, and then finally, uh, I keep finding these little cases where network diagrams are super useful. So it was interesting, Charles was showing in the GAV2 kind of uh, Google finally recognizing just how horrible Sankey charts are for path analysis. So this is something we've played around with a little bit and we haven't really nailed it, but thinking there's so many things we can think about as a network and our website, I will claim, is one of them. We can think about pages or screens as a node and movement between them as an edge and start to just kind of understand the, the, the natural kind of clustering of content on the, on the site. Um, by doing this. And we've kind of played around with, let's just take the first level, oh, Raphael? This was uh, R. Did, uh, the, oh my God, Viz, V-I-S something. It's based on a D3, no, it's based on a JavaScript package called, maybe just Viz, V-I-S, I think. Um, and this is actually interactive. I found myself doing it a lot also with actual trying to understand clients' uh, data or system configurations. We have like 27 systems that are generating data. Data is moving in between different systems. And it was super useful. We did a whole audit a couple of times, capturing all their systems, how much data is in the systems, how much data is flowing between them. And it was like, oh, this is, it's a network diagram. Let's, let's actually find a way that we can uh, explore it. You're obviously missing a lot of detail uh, as to exactly which pages, but these are interactive. You can change them to be interactive, uh, but just getting kind of a high level in some cases. So this, not really an Excel or Google Sheets thing, but other options. So my big point, it's all about reducing cognitive load. There are an enormous number of resources. A lot of them actually reference each other. So. The, this book is the one that I've literally just read on the flight over. I'd read, uh, she's storytellingwithdata.com is Cole's uh, website. She has a great blog. But it was shocking how much of this presentation is represented with many of the same language and points um, in that book. So now I feel like I've kind of inadvertently completely ripped her off. The reason is because she refers to Nancy Duarte, to Stephen Few, to Edward Tufte, which are the same kind of pillars of the research around this that, uh, that I came from. So uh, Stephen Few, Show Me the Numbers, is his book that you'll hear referenced a lot more. I've read Information Dashboard Design, the first edition and the second edition. I think it covers all the basics. And so even though it's about dashboards, it gives you a whole lot about how are we taking in information uh, quickly and efficiently. And then uh, the Guide to Information Graphics, Donna Wong, she's Moved, several years ago moved on from the Wall Street Journal. But looking at journalism um, uh, newspapers, which are maybe, if they're, especially if they're working in black and white, they have to communicate complex information fairly, I mean, given depending on the media outlet, I guess, um, in a way that can be comprehended so you can learn a lot from them. 538.com is a great resource when it comes to how they do visualization and seeing how complex ideas can be represented effectively and clearly to support whatever point they're trying to draw forward. So the one thing about Cole's book is it says storytelling, and this is her book, this is from 2015, and there, her subtitle is A Data Visualization Guide for Business Professionals. So overall, the book is really just about data visualization. There's one chapter towards the end that is about storytelling. But storytelling is kind of this broader thing, which is how do we actually craft a narrative? How do we present the overall results? And there are a couple of great books that have come out within the last like six months, I think. Um, and we've actually had both Nancy and Brent on our the Digital Analytics Power Hour podcast. Uh, Nancy was, well, they both were awesome. Nancy was very recently. But she has gone through, Nancy Duarte is kind of the, the maven of uh, presentation, effective presentation, has been doing it for years, has built a whole uh, consultancy around it. But she went through a ton of the presentations they had done for clients, found the ones that used data, did a whole meta-analysis of them, and then kind of converted that into, ah, what is it that really works here? So it's got things down to the, the precision of the words that you use in the, in the heading of a slide and how those will be perceived and what people will take from it. So that's fascinating. Uh, Brent Dyke's book just came out. He takes, um, it's a little bit of a denser read, but 
he does a lot of kind of examples from history uh, way back hundreds of years to, to more recently and then talks about kind of specific principles of true kind of crafting a narrative. Um, and he then also touches on data visualization a bit. So with that, and then I, Brain Rules by John Medina if you're just interested in the neuroscience. So with that, thank you very Ladies much. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the one, the only, the master, the honorable, Dr. Professor Timothy Rose.